Hey, hey, everybody. Hope everyone's doing well. My name's Dave, and I'm here with Steve Edwards, and we're back for another week of Ask Steve, answering all your mule and donkey questions so that you can have an amazing relationship with your animal. How's your day going so far, Steve? Well, I've been up on the roof uh, uh, down to Bunkhouse trying to fix a couple of leaks, but I think we may have it under control. They're saying we're going to get about an inch and a half of rain. I'm looking forward to that. That will be great. It's real pretty out there on the ranch after it rains uh, quite a bit there. Yeah, it's amazing. What we usually call six-week grass only lasts six weeks normally. It's been going almost three months now, and it looks like carpet out there. It looks really, really nice. Now, some folks may not be aware, but the last time that it wound up raining, it actually did quite a number. Why don't you go ahead and tell them the story there of... uh, of what happened, how you had to wind up using your bunkhouse, and what you got going on now. Uh, help my memory here. I've had so many of those good your ones. Your barn, man. Oh, that's right, the barn. Oh, <laughs> oh I forgot all about that. Oh, yeah, you, I actually had You blocked uh, it out, bar- didn't you? You blocked it yeah. out. Yeah, I think, why did I have to did I get in trouble with my wife again? What happened? <laughs> anyway, yeah, the, we had a microburst, and it blew the roof right off my barn. Now, you got to remember, this was a hay barn. That's what it was. So we had a telephone post in the ground, about 10 foot, and uh, we had a, a, a gravel bottom, and we throwed some shelves up, and that's where I kept my saddles. I never thought, <laughs> never thought I'd be selling saddles all over the world like I've been doing, Dave. This is crazy. And, and uh, so I, I figured this was just going to be a temporary thing. Well, it just so happens, I believe the good Lord had a thought and idea there because he blew the roof off of that barn and uh, took that whole roof about 300 yards down the hill. And, of course, we had all my friends and neighbors and the fire department all came over because I had all those saddles boxed up in there. We took all that stuff out. We put it in the bunkhouse. And then I went to the insurance company. I said, hey, my uh, my barn blew apart. They said, oh, your barn wasn't insured. I said, say what? Oh, yeah, we, we insured that uh, 10 foot wide by t- by 15 foot long building right there for $16,000, but not your barn. Hmm, there's something wrong with that picture. But anyway, what can I say? Uh, so I got blessed by the Lord. He said, all right, let's, uh, I bought some uh, some of these containers, shipping containers. We put four of them together, so uh, that's 32 uh, wide and 40 foot long. Uh, We cut out two walls out of two of them, made it 16 foot on the inside. Anyway, long story short, it's one beautiful building, and uh, I didn't know what the Lord has in mind, so I can see now, man, (laughs) these saddles uh, and tack and stuff. I can't believe it, Dave. i got folks all over the world ordering this stuff down. So, oh yeah, the bu- yeah. the building, uh, the uh, the storage building is is awesome, and now you've actually got air conditioning, and that comes in handy in the summer when you're out there for a few hours packing orders. Yeah, yeah, got a little air conditioning unit in it. Even got a heater, and we got indoor flush toilets. Woo! Moving on up. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a great building. It just you know I I didn't have to worry about permits and stuff because it's a mobile. So yeah. I just plug it into my RV spot, and uh, and that's it. And I got a I got a, a super uh, place to store my saddles now. Inch and a half plywood that's marine and, and it's all insulated. Boy, it's a tremendous blessing. Bring on the storms. Yeah, right, right. You're ready this time. Well, hey, we've got some folks tuning in, hanging out with us today. We've got uh, Eileen Easterday. We've got Tracy Foley. We've got uh, Tammy Long, Natasha uh, Hockaden, uh, David Pengelly, uh, Jerry Camburn, and uh, Ben Toman. All of them have uh, have left a comment here in Facebook, and I'm excited to get going and start answering some of these questions. Boy, let's go. I, I, I tell you what, I've been so blessed this past week of people contacting me, Dave, and said, hey, you know, I, I th- I've had my mules to a trainer and nothing was going right. So I brought him home and I started looking on the Internet and there you were. And I, wow, Dave, I mean, to have these people say they've been able to do it themselves, that's fantastic. I'm, yeah. I, that's, that, I, I'm actually training more mules than people now 
on the internet than I was going out and traveling all over the United States. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah, I, yeah, it's it's great. That's awesome. Well, hey, we will go ahead and uh, and we like to reward uh, quick replies here. And Ben had a very uh, quick reply. He when we when we scheduled this live stream, he put the question in there. He said, "After groundwork." So this is what we're going to get started with. After groundwork, how should I introduce her to a pack saddle? So after groundwork, how do I introduce my mule to a pack saddle? Okay, so after groundwork looks like this to me. When I pick up on the lead rope, now get that thought. Pick up on it, not pull on it. I pick up on it. And I ask the mule to go to the right or left, and the mule responds. And then I, I let the pressure off the lead rope, and the mule stops. I wiggle the lead rope just a little bit, and the mule backs up. Then ground foundation is, is, in, is in a good place, and it's time to now start going to pack saddles. It's, it's never a time frame, but it's how much will the mule listen. And if everything is done correctly, I can have that lead rope laying on the ground, and this is the eventual goal, have that lead rope laying on the ground and pack that mule and it stand completely still. Now, how do I know that's possible? That's the way I train my mules. But at the World Championships at Bishop, when I was 42 years old, I actually packed an empty mule in 58 seconds, and I never touched the lead rope. So a couple, uh, well, I guess it was probably maybe a year ago, maybe less than a year, you were in Hawaii, and there were some, um, I don't know if it was mule rides, donkey rides, horse rides, but all that the animal was tied up to there on the beach was just a stick in yeah. the sand. Yep. It wasn't a pole. It was just a little stick shoved in the sand with the lead rope tied around it. And, and you sent that in, and you said, this is what we're going for. That's right. That That is truly halter communication i mean what's a little stick in the sand i mean all the mule all the horse is going to do and this happened to be a case was a horse all he had to do was wiggle his nose he'd pull that stick out of there but because that horse had so much communication with that halter and and had respect for that halter there's the key thing respect that that lead rope was hanging loose and just in a stick. That's a good point, Dave. I mean, that's what it takes, folks. Uh, you know, unfortunately, we figure we got to have a great big hitching post and this sort of thing. We don't. That mule, if they respect this stuff, they don't take nothing at all to make them stand there. Well, and answer me this. To me, after hearing you talk all this time, it seems to me that respect for the halter is, it really comes down to so let me let me combine this. One, you've got the properly adjusted halter. You've got it, you know, two, two fingers above the nostril is what we say, right? Yep. yep. Two fingers above the nostril, properly adjusted in all the right places. Mm -hmm. um, and then you say you don't need to be tugging on things. It's it's you play the tune with your finger, so it's just subtle movements. Yeah. And a properly adjusted halter communicates to the right places. So it's less about it's less about forcing the animal to stay, and it's he respects the halter. So the second that he moves his head this way, immediately that's is that what it is? Immediately it's uncomfortable, or or he's equated it to being uncomfortable. And he says, "Well, gosh, even though that's just a little bump, I guess I got to stay here." Is that how it's supposed to work? Absolutely. Hey, Dave, if they can feel a fly and don't want a fly bothering them, then the only thing they're interested in. When you pick up on that lead rope, they're wanting you to let go. Yeah. So they're going to keep following you. They'll keep going until you let go. As soon as you let go, uh, then then ah, that's what they're looking for. That's what they're looking for. So think about a fly. You know, why in the world do we have to have a, a great big snap? Or why do we have to have a heavy lead rope? You see me do demonstrations just with a piece of baling twine. Yeah. Will the will the snap ultimately cause damage because of the sensitivity? Oh yeah. You know, mules carry uh, they care more about their nose than they do anything else. They get that from their daddy, the donkey. Mm -hmm. So with that heavy snap and, and those two knots rolling back and forth on the nose, uh -huh. uh, that's when they start stiffening the neck muscles and and the throat latch. And we don't think about it. We think it's all right, but here the head is up high. If you notice that horse, 
uh, on the sand on the beach there, his head was down. He wasn't trying to protect himself because he didn't have to. He didn't yeah. have all that weight from that snap. Just a simple little piece of half inch rope. That's good to know. Um, so we have a couple more people hopping in here. We've got Ernie Mays and Phil Hughes. So I want to welcome them and say thanks for coming and hanging out, y'all. Appreciate it. Ernie's chiming in here from uh, Ardmore, Oklahoma. So and Phil says just finishing moving hay. Time to relax. Phil Hughes from Nebraska. So we're glad to have you guys here. And the uh, the next question that we've got here comes in from uh, Jerry Camburn, and he says, "Can you talk about picking up the back feet?" Now we've got a video that I'm going to link to. That shows you going through quite the ordeal with picking up the back feet. But for those who are watching right now and for Jerry, um, can you just share a little bit about you know things to consider when we go to pick up the back feet? Of course, the front foot, uh, I've heard you talk about the scapula. There's a little button there. You feel around, you find that button, you push the scapula, and they will be trained to get their foot up. And you may use a, is it, what, what's it called, a little, a little whip a little or quirk. something like that? Yeah, yeah. a little, quirk, little piece of... Uh... Uh, like an old fishing rod or yeah, something like that. Yeah, you'll tap it to get it to come stiff. up to kind of cue it. But it's what about the back feet? That's a little different. Well, now, the back feet, we're going to do something similar to the same thing in that we're going to put our hand on the uh, hip bone and we're going to take our quirk, our, our long st uh, stick, and we're going to go down the leg. And then once we kind of get just past the hock, we're going to tap a little bit. And then when we tap, the mule picks his foot up just a teeny bit. We quit tapping. We take the hand off of the hip bone. And immediately, right after that, we put our hand back on the hip bone again. We move the rod down. We tap a little bit more. The mule says, okay, when you put your hand on the hip bone and you tap, I'm to bring my foot up and then you'll stop tapping. Yes. All right, now here's the third time. I put my hand on the hip bone the mule should then move a little bit. And if he moves just a little bit, that's a start. So picking up the foot needs to be in steps of 3, 6, 9, 12, Dave, just like I always do. Everybody wants to hurry up and pick up the foot. Don't do that. Do it in small little steps where the mule says, I understand. So we went from the hawk, and we went down about four inches. We tapped. The mule picked up his foot a little bit. We went down about eight inches then from the hawk. We tapped. The mule picks his foot up. And now, as soon as we touch the hip bone, the mule goes to pick his foot up. That's enough for today. And then the, the next time we train, remember, four to six hours a week is a lot of, a lot of training. Uh, and that video will point it out. And you can kind of see how I went ahead with that video and kind of fast forwarded so people can see what it looks like. But always look at four to six hours a week is a lot of training. And do everything of three today, a couple of days later, a week later, three more. So now you got six, and then nine, and then 12, and then you got a foundation. But now here's the key thing. Picking up the foot correctly so that we disengage the hip bone is very important. Because what happens is when you put your hand on the hip, the mule then knows to shift over to three legs. And that's really important because otherwise what it ends up being is... Most people end up being the fourth leg and the mule is leaning on them, trying to hold them up. So when we do this, we have our hand on the hip, we slide our hand down by the hawk, we bring the leg forward, then we go straight back and over to the left and we hold the foot. Notice nowhere in there did I say pull on the foot, on the leg. Don't do that. As you're coming, you got your left hand on the hip, slide your hand down, you barely touch. He moves, barely touch some more. He moves, barely touch some more. But when you go to pulling on him, he's going to brace on you and he's got you. That that pulling thing is going to get going to get you in trouble. Yeah, I'll post that video there because it's going to be a it's 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 really really good. Uh, I think folks a lot of times think that you know you just show up and things get better, but this this mule was not was not wanting to let you. Pick up her, uh, pick up her legs there, and she let you know it. And it took a lot of patience. It took a lot of time. Explain this to me, though. You you said you know four to six hours a week is a lot of time. That doesn't seem like a lot of time to me. That seems like that seems like just a 
you know, 30, 45 minutes a day. Can you, can you tell me why four to six hours a week is the appropriate time for these animals? Because in my mind, I would think that I'd want to go two, three, four hours a day on training so that I could get them up to speed more quickly. Dave, hold on a minute. Somebody's at the door. <laughs> oh, did somebody show is. up? Clear out here. Hold on just a minute. I'll tell you what, folks. This is one of the areas that really does that, – that I'm very interested in because I hear Steve all the time saying – you don't want to overtrain. You don't want to overtrain. And in my mind, I'm thinking, hey, I want to get out there. I want to make the most of my time. I don't want, I don't want to be sitting around, you know, wasting time that I could be out there training because I want to get out on the trail, right? So it just is kind of a little bit of a head tilt for me. And I think it's a head tilt for a lot of people saying, hey, don't overtrain four to six hours a week. That's really, that's really the sweet spot for most mules. Um, you know, if, if anybody else has that question, you should see a little thumbs up or something on the screen. You can tap that and show us that you, uh, that you agree that like, Hey, it's a little bit of a head tilt. Steve, would you talk a little bit about that? So the big problem is we think we have to train every day in order to get the mule to understand. We don't. The part of their brain, they remember there are two brains. There's got a brain on the right, one on the left. So the part of their brain that says this is new information and I need to do it because I'm uncomfortable, that's not much bigger than a walnut, folks. And you're trying to put all that information in there into that walnut. Don't do that. They understand things a teeny bit at a time, a little bit at a time. So when you give it to them in small pieces, then when you finally decide, okay, now I want to stop, boy, you're going to see, boom, a stop. But when people try to make them stop and try to get it all one time, that's when they start having problems. Same thing with picking up a foot. When they want to pull a foot, they want to make the foot come out. The reason that is, is because they're making it happen. They're, press, they're pressuring the animal, and therein lies the problem. If you do just a little bit at a time, that mule uh, will, will get it, and that donkey will get it. It's amazing. So it's really about communicating, if what I hear you saying is correct, it's really about communicating on their terms, on their schedule, rather than trying to force them on our terms and our schedule. That's right. You know, we can, we can take a lot in on our, on our brain. We can because we're humans. And we, don't, and we have the cranial lobe that tells both sides what to do, but not them. Their life is comfortable, uncomfortable. Their life is eat and drink. And then you clean up what's after that, you see. So that's their life, folks. You know, they, as far as they're concerned, for you to get on their back, you're a predator. For you to come in to corral with them, you're a predator. They're a prey animal. So for them to do things for us, that's like yeah. trying to get uh, a cat to try to do something for an elephant, folks. Can't be done. But if you do things small segments at a time and no food rewards, you, that's, that's a rare thing going to be. Just take the pressure off of them. That's all they need. That's good. That's very good. A couple more folks chiming in here. We've got uh, Dave and Steve Scholl saying hello. Uh, or D. Scholl saying hello, Dave and Steve. That's what we got right there, oh, there D. We Scholl. Go. Okay. Uh, we have Hamed uh, from uh, North Dakota, frigid North Dakota. Uh, we've got uh, Sam and Renee Crawford watching from Willow, Alaska again. So glad to have you guys here. And uh, let's see here. Ernie just sent in a question. He said, I heard Steve make a comment that our saddle mules do not need to be turned out in pasture. I wish he would elaborate on this subject. So um, what, can you elaborate what the question is there and where you mentioned this, maybe what the context was, and then answer the question? Absolutely. It's my one of my favorite subjects, and that is feed. You and I, when we go to a smorgasbord, we always overeat, always. There's, and if, but if we stay on a diet that fits our mode of work, so if, we, if I got a mule and I'm going to take him out and we're going to work cattle heavy that day, on that day I'm going to give him a little grain so that he's got the energy to get through the day. If you put him out on that, on that uh, heavy rich feed, They'll be plumb crazy. It's amazing. I've had people take their animals and take them off of that, that heavy feed and bring them in and start feeding them correctly according to their needs. 
and then that really changes things. But here's the problem. They're always out there eating. I've had folks all the time say that they can't catch their mule. Well, why should you? You know, the mule's got everything he needs. He don't need anything from you, the predator. He's got his food, his water, and his buddies. He's in his world. He's fine. But when you put him out there in that pasture, all you're going to do is overfeed him. And here's the downside. You've got a horse body on a donkey foot. You've got all that stress upon that foot. I can't tell you how many people this past month have contacted me with all kinds of foot problems. And I find out that they've had their animals out on rich feed during the, during the summertime or during the spring. And next thing you know, they're fluffing off a hoof. You know, so uh, they, they don't need to be eating all the time, just like us. Okay, What they need is they need a quality food that will, that will get them through what they're doing. If it's just standing around, they need that maintenance feed. If it's going to be work, they need to be maintained for that. And, and at my ranch, all of my corrals are 10 foot wide, 20 foot deep. I do not turn them out on a pasture. And when they're here to be trained, when, when I used to train a lot, we fed them everything at night. We fed them all they needed. We, we fed uh, a, a grass hay, and, but most of the time we fed pellets. And we fed them grain, whole oats, so that they'd have their energy and wouldn't blow their top line. So the next morning, they'd been eating, they'd been drinking all night, and the next morning, they're waiting at the gate ready to go to work. You do not have to feed them breakfast and then go ride. I mean, you can if that makes you feel good, but they're still thinking about their breakfast, and I don't know about you, after I'm eating, I'm not really ready to go to work right off the bat. Yeah, right. I put two uh, two resources in the comment section. I put one, a link to the Feed Talk video where we talk all about your feed and nutrition program, kind of what makes a good feed and nutrition program. Um, and then also I put a link to the article, Mules Can't Stand Prosperity, which goes into what it is you're talking about right there into more detail. That's one of your favorite articles to share with folks because um, no. cause it, is, is, it is a real problem. I mean, these animals, if they're out in pasture, they can just eat and eat and eat and eat. And it's exactly like you said, they don't need you for nothing. So you want, I've heard you say, you want them to look to you for everything. See you as the herd leader. See you as their, their provider. See you as the person who's giving them their needs. Rather, I don't, I don't need anything from him. I got everything I need right here. Yep. Yeah, on top of their health. I mean, it's amazing. I, I took my students at Pierce College, and we had 10 rows of mules and donkeys on one side, 10 rows of mules and donkeys on the other side. We fed all the ones on the left-hand side just hay. We fed the ones on the right-hand side the pellet. And it was amazing to see how much better mentally and physically the ones that the pellet did compared to ones with the hay. Uh, plus, you know, there was, there was five wheelbarrows of, of, uh, of manure over here and, and two and a half over here. But here's the key thing. Here's the fun thing about this. They, they wanted to turn their animals out over the weekend into this kind of a little bit of a pasture that we had grass and stuff. So we went ahead and turned them all loose. And I told them, I said, you're going to see a difference in your animals, how they act when you try to catch them on Monday. Sure enough, sure enough, people had problems with their animals. It took them three, four, five days to get them back to where they were before they put them in a pasture, mentally and physically. They're out there with their buddies. They don't need you, the predator. They need you, the herd leader, and they don't need to be out there playing with their buddies. They need to understand that life is like this. This is their corral. When I need you, we go to work. And most of all, they get fed and watered correctly. And this is what's important. This is what's extremely important. You need to be watching their poop and their urine because it'll tell you how healthy they are. I've had three people this year this past month, tell me about the colic and their animals dying. Get that now, folks. Mules do colic. Donkeys do colic. And they will get the hoof disease and stuff. And why was it? Because they had done some changing of the feed. That was some of the problems. So, folks, you cannot believe how much difference it makes when you keep an eye on their poop, their poop and their urine and their water intake. You, that's a, that's a, that animal depends upon you to, to keep its health right. Yeah. Um, speaking of buddies, right? They're out there and they, they want to be with their buddies. 
There's the flip side of that where they get Buddy Sauer, and that's a question from Natasha. Um, I feel like we keep talking about this more and more and more, so we'll have to put together an article. But uh, Natasha posted a question here on Facebook, and, uh, and she says, My mule is Buddy Sauer. When I take away a buddy or take him anywhere without his buddies, he will pace, paw, and do anything to get your attention. When you go up to get him, he stops. But how do I correct it when he does it? Uh, when he does it only when I'm away. We once treated him like a colt and tied him up and watched him until he stopped paw- pacing and pawing, and it took 13 hours <laughs> until yeah. he gave up. I'm looking to break this habit. What would you say to Natasha? Get you a wheelbarrow because you can't break the habit. This right here, Natasha, is because they are a herd animal. They feel more comfortable being with another equine. So... You can, I've had them literally, I've taken them and taken them to another ranch and left them there thinking that's going to fix the problem. As soon as I brought them back, or matter of fact, at the other ranch, they, they found some buddies and decided, okay, that's what I need anyway, you know. So you, you're going to have to, that's where it comes down to training. It comes down to training that when they say they want to be with their buddies, then you make it hard on the buddies. So they want to, they, they lick toward their buddy on, with their nose. You give them a sharp reprimand with your bridle. Bump, bump. You know, they may look a little sneakier next time. Bump them again. But you cannot take away what the good Lord put in there. I don't care what people may say. It is impossible to take out that hurting mentality. Now, can I put you in a, in a corral with other people and have the animals ride by you, and then you keep your mule standing still. Yes, but here's the qu- here's the deal. You done it. You taught the mule by your voice, hands, legs, and seat. Don't be looking at them other animals. If you look to the left, bump him on the right. If you look to the right, bump him on the left. Okay. And then at the same time, use your legs because your legs says. I want you to stand still or I want you to move. So it comes down to you, you know. Uh, my One of my favorite stories, talk about barn sour, is a lady in Pennsylvania. She, We had several people there and they asked me the questions, you know. And finally she come up, she says, I got a question for you. I got a barn sour mule. And I said, all right, well, tell me what's going on. She says, well, you watch. So she climbed in the saddle. And she rode off away from us maybe 200 yards. Man, all of a sudden, that mule turned around and come right back to us. We had other mules around us, but that mule did not feel comfortable going out. He felt comfortable here with the other animals. And she couldn't stop him. She couldn't turn him. Nothing. He finally stopped when he wanted to next to another animal. And I said, huh, let me have that animal. So I took the bridle off. I put my mule rider's martingale on. I got on that thing and I adjusted the stirrups. And here's what I had that she did not have. I had spurs. That says right here is going to be uncomfortable. Tap, tap, tap. <clears throat> going forward, <clears throat> it's not a matter of, of comfort anymore. As long as you're going forward, no spurs. But if you say, okay, I'm going to turn around and go back, as soon as you go to the right, guess what you're going to meet? A spur. Bump. And, oh, wait a minute. That's uncomfortable then if I go that way. And then they go to the left. Bump. And pretty soon they start thinking straight. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> here's the next thing. She said, he won't go up that hill. I went up the hill. He doesn't like coming down the hill. He came down. Why is it? Because I was using my legs with the spurs. You do not have to harpoon them. You use your calf to ask, side of your stirrup to tail, spur to demand. And that's what they understand. Ask, tail, demand, comfortable, uncomfortable. Right here, the mule was comfortable. Out there, the mule was uncomfortable because his buddies aren't there. What did I do? I made here uncomfortable with the spurs. And anytime you made a wrong decision, uncomfortable with the spur. You don't always have to use your hands. Use your legs. There you are. 
So I've got something pretty cool to share with you. I, at least I'm, I'm excited about it. Um, and I think it's going to give some hope to some folks out there. So real breakthrough moment. I, it, for those of you who don't know, while Steve's talking, I'm going through. I have another window up here on my screen, and I'm sorting through the questions, and I'm replying back to people who have sent these questions in so that everyone gets what they need. Um, and, uh, and as I was typing, I've got my next question queued up here. And as I was topi- typing, I heard you talking, Steve. And, and so I'm listening with one ear and I'm answering a question with another one. And I heard you say, you know, if, if he starts to move his head to his right, you tap and, and like just subconsciously, I wasn't even thinking about it. I, you might've even seen my hand, Steve. I pulled my hands up and I started b- bumping. Did yeah. you see that? Yeah, yeah, I pulled my hands up and just – I wasn't even thinking it. And I was like, yeah, this is what you do. And so immediately I thought, you know what? If me, a city slicker, someone who has just no experience around these equine can pick it up and can get it after hearing it multiple times, I think anybody can pick it up and get it. And I think it's easy to get frustrated because you hear it, but then – you have those breakthrough moments. And, and for me, I feel like right now is kind of one of those breakthrough moments where it's like I've heard it enough to where it's okay. It's starting to become second nature after a year, after two years. And, and th- there's hope, right? Oh, yeah. Hey, talking about this, I love it when people, I call them up and they just purchased something like this. Michael over in New Mexico, I call him up and I said, this is Steve Edwards. And it it was quiet for a second. He said, this isn't really Steve Edwards. I said, yes, it is. He said, you're calling me? I said, Michael, you called, needed some help, and you've purchased a couple things. What can I do to help? He said, Steve, I travel. He he works for a a big uh, uh, electrical company. Mm -hmm. So they do power poles, and Mm -hmm. when when the power goes down, they're right there. He says, I travel all around the Silver City area around New Mexico, corner of it. When I get in my truck, I turn my phone on and I listen to you say, do it this way, do it this way, this way. I've been riding all my life. He says, now, he says, when I go out to do with my mule, it, it's almost look like, like they look at me like, you haven't been watching Steve Edwards, have you? <laughs> he, he, that's what he said. I said, really, Michael? He says, Steve, he says, you cannot believe how much better I'm able to get along with my mules now. He said, I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. And Dave, that's what it's all all about for me. You you know, you've heard me, you know. um, I've learned from a lot of guys and this sort of thing, and I want to share it. And when I hear testimonies like that, wow, you know, I'm tickled. I just got an email from Garth Jensen. I sent you the paperwork, I mean the email. And it shows, Garth bought a saddle, Actually, three saddles, pack equipment, all the stuff back in, in 2016. He just sent me some pictures of his mules with a big elk rack on the, on the pack saddle. And, he's, and just a little note there. Hey, Steve, thanks so much for the great equipment and the help helping me get communicate with my mules. That's what I'm looking for, buddy. That's what we like to hear. That's big time yeah. what we like to hear. Uh, we got a couple more people who are hopping on with us. Uh, Sundance Kids says, thank you. This is a blessing. And so we're, we are pleased to bless. So Absolutely. you are more than welcome. And then we've got Richard Matthews. That's Cap- is that Captain hey, Richard? That's Captain. Yes, sir. Captain, Captain Matthews, say hi, Chaplain Steve. So very good to have you guys hanging out and spending some time with us. Um, oh, and Brian, uh, Brian Riom, Re- Riom, I think I'm saying that correctly yep. one of the two ways says thank you for the knife with the saddle so that was a nice little touch that he appreciated and yep. uh kayla gooner says hello steve and dave from somewhat rainy southern california Ooh, oh. southern california i gotta get out there to disneyland i want to take my little ones i got a seven-year-old a five-year-old and a two-year-old and i want to take them out to disneyland so hopefully awesome. it won't be raining too long we'll be able to get out there the uh the next question that i got here uh, it comes from uh, from Sharon. She emailed in. So this is kind of a follow-up with the Buddy Sour, but says, um, I need instructions on pawing. Uh, I had one person tell me that they will never get over it, and then I've had some people say that some mules do. Um, I will start to, let's see, uh, he's pawing and is dangerous once he's in the trailer. So what are your thoughts there? Well, you know, what so many people try to do, we get into there again a make them do it situation they hobble the two front feet and thinking okay that's going to fix it hobbling two front feet 
is not for feeding. It's not for doing anything but standing still. It's not for pawing. It's made to stand still, period. So, this is another one of these things. The good Lord give it to them, and you're not going to stop it. Can you train it? Yes, you can make them uncomfortable. Okay, why are they pawing? They paw the snow off of the grass so they can eat grass. They paw the ice so they can get to water. They know that if they paw, they can get what they want. All right? Now, here we are in a trailer. I don't want to be in a trailer. Paw, 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 paw. I don't want to be in a trailer. Paw, 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 paw. And it is frustrating. All right? So now, we take them out to the hitching rail. We put a big rubber mat down. So when they paw, they only paw, pardon me, on the rubber mat. All right? Now, how do we make them uncomfortable? We're going to play some poker with this mule because they're really good at bluffing you out. So we're going to take a strap, a leather strap, and we're going to put 16 inches of one-inch heavy chain on each strap. We're going to put the strap through the chain and we're going to attach it above the knee. I'm going to do that on the right and on the left. And then we're going to pay, take a piece of bailing twine, attach it to the top length of the chain, go across the back, and attach it to the, the, the length on the other side. That keeps the chain from going down on the leg, because as they paw, it will get sweaty and the chain will come off. So, when they paw, the chain then hits their cannon bone and makes them uncomfortable. Now, they can be a bad power, so you want to get back and let them go. Just let them do whatever they're going to do to themselves. Because, folks, I've even seen them fall on the ground. And that is called a spoiled mule. And you need to let them hit the ground to see that that makes them a whole lot more uncomfortable. But they did it. You did not do it. So let's go back. We're playing poker with this mule. He quits pawing. I'm standing back 100 yards or so watching he quits pawing. I say, good for you. Yes, yes, good for you. And I go walking toward him. I take loose the string. I take off both hobbles. And then I hang the hobbles up where he can look at them. I got a nail by my hitching post. They can look at it. Or feeding time. If they go pawing during feeding time, I put these chains on. When they paw, it makes them uncomfortable. And then when they quit pawing, I take them off. And that's the key thing, Dave. When they are pawing, you, you leave them on. When they quit pawing, take them off so that they can see that's what you want. Now, here's the thing with the mule. Here's the thing with the donkey. As soon as you move them five feet, it's a new world. It's a new place. So they will paw again. So you'll have to do it again. Pretty soon they will learn that in the trailer, we don't paw. At the hitching post, we don't paw. Now, when there's snow out there, we want to paw to get uh, feed, you can paw, okay? But in this place, it's against the rules to paw. Makes sense. I like that approach. I like that approach a lot. Um, so hopefully for, uh, I think it was for Sharon, I hope that will help. We've got a question from uh, Eileen. Eileen, I hope you didn't think we forgot about you. We've got a question here, and she asks, could we briefly mention lugworm infestations coming from donkeys and mules, infecting horses when they are pastured together? Yeah. Um, let's see. I've, I can't read. Ivermectin controls. Ivermectin. Yeah, controls lugworms. So I learned to rotate wormer. Thanks yes. so much for being here. So what, what's she yeah. asking? Because I don't understand what that is. What's she asking? Um, so you can, you can let us know exactly what it is and then answer the question. Another reason not to have these animals out in a pasture is because even though they got all that grass out there, they'll eat their own manure. And when they do, they ingest the eggs and they end up getting uh, uh, worms in their, uh, in their system. And, and you got the large and, and, and small strongi. And the reason they're called large and small is some of them got like big mouths. And they literally attach themselves to the side of the intestines and suck all of the nutrients out of their system and eventually even poke a hole in them you know, and, and impact them. 
So, another reason, don't put them out in a pasture. Especially with a lot of other animals, cattle, deer, stuff like this. It's amazing what they can get. So, uh, yes, you want to use, there's a lot of good wormers out there. Uh, you do want to interchange. And if you're going to put them on a pasture, then in every quarter, every four months, you worm these animals and do not worm them with the same animal, with the same uh, wormer. There's a lot of good products out there today, and it's getting better all the time. The key thing, though, is every spring you worm them and get this again. I'm always pushing this. Get their teeth floated. So that will help out. But uh, there's, there's no way to get around it. Now, even in the corrals, they'll even chew their own little manure. If you go to uh, the Phoenix Zoo where I put together that equine program, they literally clean those corrals, and this is USDA specifications now, folks. This is what the federal government mandates for animals that are going to be under public scrutiny, i.e. the zoo, okay? And that is there's no manure left in that, in that pen, you know, because they will eat it. They will chew it. That's what they do, you know. Uh, it's, it's all part of life, but the best thing you can do is put them on a good worming program. Very good. So Eileen, hopefully that helps. Um, hopefully that gives you some clarity and some steps forward. If you're still watching and you got a few questions that you want to follow up, I'll be looking for them. The next question that I got here comes um, from uh, one of our customers who emailed in, uh, and she says, would a come-along halter or a rope halter help with rearing up when I try to walk my 10-month-old uh, donkey? Absolutely. Come along, hitch. Come along, hitch. Come along, hitch. Six months builds a foundation. Four to six hours a week is a lot of training. Will it help? Absolutely. Because when the donkey rears up, he's usually, the reason they rear up because it's unusual for a donkey. It's not unusual for a baby necessarily, but a donkey or a mule just don't want to do that. They're usually rearing up because they can't try to escape you any other way. They can't seem to go to the right. They can't seem to go to the left. They can't seem to back up or run through you. So, okay, rearing up is the other thing. Now, if your donkey is a jack, give him brain surgery. Take and castrate him, and that'll change a lot of his ideas. But come along hitch, come along hitch. Use it all the time. Do not tie up with the come along hitch. Use your rope halter to tie up with to a chain. Very good. Appreciate that. Uh, let's see here. We got a couple more people. Uh, well, actually, we've got D. Witt saying, "Hey, sorry I am late. That's okay, D. We're glad that you're here. We're glad that you're joining us and spending some time with us today." Um, let's see here. The next question that I've got is about cinches, um, and the question is ultimately, how tight should my cinches be, and is it different than a horse? Night and day different than a horse because horse should tighten the front cinch have the back loose, the back cinch snug. It should not see any daylight in, uh, with that back cinch. Now, horses are V-shaped in their shoulders, or A-shaped in their shoulders, and, and mules are V-shaped in their shoulders, so that's why that saddle goes forward. So, it's important that the back cinch be the tightest. It's important you do not use billets. That's long straps that hold the back cinch on. Take those billets off, Put some nylon latigos on there, and that way you can snug it up slowly and easy. So how tight is going to depend on you, the rider. How tight is going to depend on the mule. So when I tighten up cinches, I, I first make everything snug where the cinches are against the belly. That's all. Just barely touching, front and rear. Then I take my lead rope, and I walk them in about a 10-foot circle. As I do that, the cinches, the saddle loosens up. Then I'll take my rear cinch and I'll snug it to the next hole. So I moved it one hole. I take my front cinch and I leave it alone. And then I make another circle, 10 foot circle. And then I take my back cinch and I go to my next hole. Now that's one, two, three times my front cinch then I'll come up snug one hole only, and that's it. When you cinch one up, always cinch up in stages, but do not do it all of them standing still in one place. 
a lot of people will try to get them. They're hitching them up at the, at the trailer or the hitching rail, and they try to get them as tight as they can right there. And then they wonder why their mule walks off when they try to get on. Well, the reason is he's trying to get himself uh, uh, comfortable. You ever watch people get in a saddle? They do what I call the wrangler dance. They get a hold of their pants, and they pull them up, and they move around and try to get their foot in the stirrup because their pants are too tight or too fat like me. So going back to this, the cinch is going to be as snug as what you need. If I'm going to rope something, I'm going to I'm going to cut them in two. I'm going to cinch it up tight a little bit at a time. If I'm just going down a trail, I want my cinch to snug. Now that's also going to depend on you, the rider. Some riders have bad hips or bad legs, so they tend to be to one side or the other. Uh, and, and that's going to tend to move the saddle a little bit, but hopefully that helps you. That's very good. Hey, uh, we just had uh, Eileen say, hey, appreciated the answer to my wormy question. So, Eileen, it's our pleasure. And uh, Jan Blake just hopped on, says, hey, a little late. Appreciate you sharing this great info, and it's our pleasure, Jan. We okay. really love doing this sort of thing. Uh, Steve is a product of a lot of different cowboys, a lot of different good people Investing in him and um, and doing this sort of thing right here is is just a fantastic way to make sure that it, it doesn't leave with him, right? They passed yeah. it on to you, and we want to pass it on to so many more um, so that it lives on in these techniques and these approaches that, that are work and that are effective, um, that, that they live on beyond, you know, beyond our time here on earth, right? Yeah, that's right. I, I just was thinking about old Nick West today an Alberta, Canada cowboy that I knew. And these cowboys were always worried. They were very humble, extremely humble. They were always worried that they were going to try to sound smart if they told me what to do. So Nick would do this. One time I was getting ready to climb on this bronc. And the bronc was a little fidgety, but I wanted to hurry up and get in the saddle. So Nick says, Steve. And I know when Nick said Steve that I better stop a minute and listen. And I stopped, and I kind of looked at the horse, and I looked toward Nick. He says, you know, I had a bronc like that one time. And he says, I think maybe you need to do this, this, and this, and help that horse through because he's not very happy. And I was getting ready to climb aboard. The horse was fidgety, wanting to go. I just wanted to ride, but I was going to rush the horse. So he told me a little story how he, one time he was trying to climb on a horse in a hurry and he got his left foot in a stirrup, his right foot he got in a gopher hole. Got hung up and it almost split him in two. So he got to thinking about that and he told me, he says, you know, you hurry that horse, you could get yourself in trouble. And that is a wonderful thing. And those guys were extremely humble. So I want to do... You know, I want to say the humble part, Dave, but I want to help people through, you know, and, and I love it when people say, man, it worked. I didn't touch him. All I did was say, try this. And it was almost like Nick telling me in the background, that's what I'm looking for, you know. So we got a question here from Arena asking specifically about a pack saddle. Says, um, how would your pack saddle fit a per Percheron? Percheron. Mm -hmm. Percheron. Yes, Pertron. Yep. That's the question. How would it fit? Uh, it, it'll fit very nice. Uh, Pertrons are excellent pack animals. Uh, we've used a lot of them over the years, all over the. What is a Pertron? A Pertron is a type of workhorse. It's a very draft workhorse, uh, very big bone, very big muscle, and they make an excellent riding animal, especially for, for, for big guys, big gals, uh, and they make a, an excellent animal for harness. So the Pertron was originally designed for plowing and for work, and wonderful-minded animal. And But you always have to remember here, when we say whatever breed, the donkey bone structure, get that, the bone donkey bone structure is prevalent. So I use the spine to make sure my saddles fit. Uh, that's what I use. I do not use measurements. You'll have a lot of these saddle makers say, well, give me four measurements and I'll send you a saddle. Well, wait a minute. If you measure them in Jan January, you're going to have one measurement. July, you're going to have another. So here's what I originally started out with so that I can understand what my angles need to be on my trees. My pack saddle was adjustable 
on the arches, on these are arches, and my pack saddle, my bars floated. So I started saying, okay, me, if I go wider on this mule, narrow on this mule, maybe I'll get a good fit. I'm always looking for a solid animal, not with his back being sore. I started learning that with my spine here and my bar here to my saddle, my bar here to my saddle, I then could fit an animal and it'd be comfortable. If I got too wide, I got up on the fat pocket, the sixth and seventh rib, and I end up crippling my animal. So, you know, when you use them every day like I did, packing freight uh, and this sort of thing, you couldn't afford to get stuck back in there 18 miles and have an animal be crippled, crippled up and, and uh, not be able to get that freight back out. Very good. I just put a link in the um, in the comment section of a video of you actually demonstrating your pack saddle, talking a little bit more about that context so folks can see it work and kind of get a little bit even uh, greater understanding of why you designed it the way that you did. The next question that I have comes from uh, one of our friends on Facebook says, I have a question for you. I have a mule that is wonderful on the ground and we have done hundreds of hours of groundwork and he is very good under saddle, really getting soft. but when he gets troubled by something, rather than spook in place, he wants to turn either to the right or to the left, and I'm just curious what I can do to help him. So what would you say? I'm, I'm guessing there might be some halter training maybe to do there, but what, what would you say we would need to do? Okay, the question needs to go back to her is this. Are you doing lateral flexions? That's one. And that's what half what you do is to soften them up you bend them around to the left and you bend them around to the right. Lateral flexions do not work on the mule and they'll end up using it against you when when you want to do something. They'll literally take their head and come over here and hold it like this and they'll run just as fast through their shoulder as they do straight ahead. Folks, trainers that train horses do lateral flexions and they disengage hindquarters. This is a mule. They, you have to disengage shoulders and you do not do lateral flexion. So find out if this is lateral flexions. Okay, I'm going ahead and I'm done. sending a, an email back there so we can get some more, uh, some more information. So let's see here. Yeah. Uh, one question that we've been getting a lot more um, and uh, oh, and before I before I get to that, uh, Travis Kennedy pops in says thank you for your time. Always enjoy your knowledge. So Travis, it's our pleasure. We're glad to be here. Uh, and David Pengali from uh, oh gosh, is it New Mexico? No, it's actually G South Carolina. I think it is. Oh my, that's gosh, my coffee like man. We're yep, getting ready to have come along coffee. How about <laughs> that, Dave? Come I along coffee. That. Come along, coffee. He says, just had all the teeth done, so I missed the show. We'll catch the replay. I think he's probably talking about his animal. He may, Maybe he's talking about himself. But uh, but good to have you here, David. Good to have you watching the replay. And that's a good, that's a good point real quick. Folks, if you miss any of these live streams, uh, not only ones that we're doing here in 2019, but if you were not watching any of our live streams from 2018, the material is fantastic. Y'all asked some amazing questions and we had some really fun times um, in uh, I think we've got 14 or 15 episodes now so I'll put a link here to the YouTube playlist where all of them are listed um, but yeah go back and watch those and if you haven't shared this live stream yet on your Facebook page gosh I sure would love to ask you to do that that's one way that we continue to get this knowledge in front of more and more people so that it, it lives well beyond any of us and it continues to help people I mean this is what we're calling a legacy here it continues Continues to have an impact on this equine community and and help folks get the most out of these animals for as as long as they've got them. So go ahead and share this on your page. You should see a little share button um, somewhere on your screen. Tap that and just share it to your page and share what you like about it. Um, question that has been coming up quite a bit, especially as we do more of these you know these community type uh, live training events, is Steve. Can I come and have you train my animal? Or can you come out and train my animal? Can I come and visit your ranch with my animal and do some training? Can you share a little bit about what what you've started to do with your training now and how often you're training, where people can find you? Because we've got a lot of folks who are wanting to go beyond just the live stream. And I know that your schedule is one where... Uh, visits to the ranch are, are a little bit more limited that they, than they have been in the past. Can you just share a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I, I basically just made a decision about four months ago to quit training. 
as far as training animals here uh, by the month and having a lot of animals here to train. Uh, being 69 years old and having the hips replaced and stuff, I've got older and fatter, so I can't move like I should. Uh, and as far as visiting, there's nothing really to see here. I don't train anymore, and uh, so I pretty much kind of stay uh, close to the public. I've always got lots of things to do, like I've been spraying weeds and doing weed eating, uh, and I'm not always here. Sometimes my neighbors need a hand with their cattle. We just had that yesterday, uh, and this sort of thing, or, or maybe I'm just doing something uh, for a friend or something like that, but but I've had folks just show up hoping just to see me, and it's best to call, but I can also tell you, I wish I could tell you I, that there was something here to watch me, but I'm not I'm not doing it anymore. Now, <clears throat> I said all that to say this, I do do expos um, where I'm flying into, like here, I'm, I'm flying into the Hoosier Expo uh, uh, the first weekend of May, and I'm going to be doing a clinic there. Dave, I can touch more people and help more people that way than I can sitting here on the ranch training yeah. one animal at a time, which I enjoy doing. I mean, I really do miss it, but I don't even have a meal on the place. Uh, I've sold my cows, so now I just help my neighbors. I've got my, my Border Collie pet, a puppy, Jesse, uh, who is here someplace in the house right now. <laughs> Jesse, you here? Jesse, here. And he was, he was here a minute ago. Uh... Uh, with me and was petting uh, and my buddy Jerry Taylor just showed up from uh, Payson who usually takes care of Jess and really great friends but I don't know Jess maybe Jerry's probably petting on him right now yeah Jess here Jess here Jess sure is a cute dog. Yes. One of the things is yes. when Jess was doing uh, yes. early on training, uh, it was real close to my house. And so, uh, Steve and his wife Susan yes. wound up coming over yes. to the house yes. while uh, yes. after they finished training and um, dropped off a cable of mine, and we got to spend a few minutes and got to hang out. And the kids got the kids love Steve. The kids, I mean, all kids love Steve. My kids especially love Steve. And Steve, I think I told this in one of the last live streams, but I'm going to tell it again. Uh, last year for Spirit Week. One of the days was uh, Western Day. And so my oldest, Isaiah, who was five going on six at the time, he said, uh, he said, oh, for Western Day, I want to wear my mule hat. And so he puts on his baseball cap, which is, uh, which is one of um, uh, Eric, uh, uh, not Eric Palmer, Eric, um, what's Eric's last name? Oh, I just lost it. Oh, ah, from, Mount, from, from, from Mountain Gear. Yeah. yeah, Mountain 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 Ridge Gear. Um, yeah, Mountain Ridge Gear. Golly, I hate it when that happens. I but Eric, that, yeah. it's uh, it's the uh, it's the original, the original AT all terrain vehicle. It's the it's the mule. And so yeah. my mom goes, my mom goes, oh, that's that's not a cowboy hat. He goes, no, it is. A real cowboy gave it to me. It's my mule hat. And so that's what he wore. <laughs> For Western Day, for Spirit Week, was his was his ATV um, yeah. ATV hat from uh, from Eric over at Mountain Ridge Gear. So, y'all, if you if you haven't checked out Eric's Mountain Ridge Gear stuff, you really ought to do that. So, Steve, who do we have here? So, this is Jesse. Uh, some of y'all probably seen some of his stuff on YouTube. Uh, he's been working cattle. He's coming up uh, in May. He'll be two years old. He's just a wonderful border collie. Uh, a good friend of mine in California, uh, Susie, uh, uh, Julie Burnett, her and Mike uh, bought him for Susan and I as a gift, uh, and he's just a great guy. I tell you, uh, I've been down at a buddy's ranch helping him out. This dog moved his first bull when he was nine months old, and this big old bull was, you know, 2,000, 2,500 pounds, and Jess did it. Jess, do you see Dave? Where's Dave? Did you tell him? Yeah, they yeah. You tell him. <laughs> hey, Jesse. Yeah, tell him. Yeah. yeah, all right. He said hi and goodbye. <laughs> Eric oh. Lynn. Oh, yes, that'll do. Good boy. Eric Lynn, Steve. Yeah, Eric Lynn. There we go. Slip my mind. I put a link yeah. to uh, to Eric's website in the uh, in the comment section there so folks can check him out. Awesome, awesome packing gear. Um, let's see here. Uh, let me see if we've got any more questions coming in. Oh, uh, so after you were talking about the uh, the lateral uh, flexions, um, Mike says, if lateral flexion doesn't work, then how are you disengaging the front shoulders? And D, 
uh, follows up with my question too, Mike Price. My donk spun right out from under me a couple of weeks ago. So you want to talk a little bit more right. there, Steve? So I've got my hands on the reins. And what I want to do is I want to pick up on the shoulder. Now, most people are using the lateral flexions to loosen the neck muscles. If you've seen any of my videos, you see where I put a surf single on, I put a halter on, and I let the mule get soft in the neck without bending them around. I'm looking for head down, nose on the vertical, balance. Top of the head, top of the hip, top of the wither, balance. By doing that, that loosens all neck muscles. And if you, you want to see if it worked, take a hold of the jugular and shake it. It'll be like a bowl of jello. That says that that neck muscles are loose. All right, so now here's what I do. If I want to disengage a shoulder, I have my hands in direct training like this. I take my right hand and I turn it up with my palm of my hand going up. That takes this shoulder up. And then when the mule crosses over or the mule moves, at first they'll just move. Eventually they'll cross over. And it's kind of like side passing or turning on the hindquarters. So what you do is you take the shoulder away and then that helps them from running through the shoulder. What most people do, Dave, is when the mule is running through his shoulder, they'll pull on the right rein to think that they'll keep them, to take them back to the right. You don't do that. You pick up on the right, left rein and you turn up on it, right, Jess? Yeah. And he's talking away. You pick up on the left rein and you pull up on it. That takes the shoulder away. Now the mule doesn't want to go the left anymore. Okay, Jess, that'll do. Yeah. Jess is telling me he's seen me do it. He knows it works. Oh, yeah, he's in agreement. He's saying, yeah, yeah. you tell him, Steve. So that's what you do, you see. So to disengage the hindquarters, you turn your wrist up like this. That then takes the shoulder away. And that's, it's just like teaching one to side pass or turn on the forehand. That shoulder has to cross, 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 cross. And what that's all you're doing is taking that shoulder and putting it where you want. So when you take your right hand and pick up on it, you're picking up on the right leg and you're putting it over here. That's what you're doing. Very good. So... That is it for uh, that is it for today. An hour goes by real quick when we're talking we mules and donkeys, doesn't it? Man, I, I guess so. Same thing. I feel the same way. I look up and uh, all of a sudden I'm like, oh my gosh, we're an hour in. It's time to uh, it's time to wrap it up. So here's the deal. I had a couple people send them, and this goes back to what you were talking about with the training. I had a couple people sending me messages um, asking about training and uh, asking if you were coming out to certain parts of the country. And so I wrote back to them. I said, hey, um, right now the only thing on the calendar, uh, of course, we're doing all these live stream events, and that's a great avenue. It's It's been fantastic. But... Um, but the only thing on the calendar is the Hoosier, the Hoosier Expo. And the way that happened was folks writing in saying, hey, you got to have Steve come back. And so they asked you to come back. And so you're going to be at the Hoosier Ex Expo. And so what I tell them is, hey, if there is an event, if you want Steve to come out to your neck of the woods, if there is an expo or a clinic or something happening there that you want to attend and have Steve there, Go ahead, write the expo organizers, write the event organizers and let them know. Say, hey, there's this fantastic trainer out in Arizona. His name's Steve Edwards. Here's a link to his website and let them know that they've got a great resource ready to travel out to wherever it needs to go. Steve can handle all the business end of it, but if you let them know, that's a great way to get Steve to come out and visit your part of the uh, part of the country. So, um, folks, that's it for today. If you have any questions that you didn't have time to put in or forgot to put in, just put them in the comment section below. I'll take a look. I'll pull them in for next week. Um, and uh, if you want to send a message uh, to Steve, steve at muleranch.com. You can send a message to me as well, support at muleranch.com. Uh, either way, we'll get back to you. And uh, Steve, is there anything you want to say before uh before we uh you know bid adieu for today no i just i really appreciate everybody uh i think it's fun when people say they've had their mules or their donkeys at a trainer and and they weren't able to get anywhere and they call me and maybe ask me a question or maybe they got a couple of my videos and the youtube stuff folks were constantly putting new stuff on there and we want to help you it's important uh, you'll find that, that I've got more stuff on there than probably in the majority of trainers. 
and I'm doing it for free, and I'm doing it because they help you. So yeah. please, you know, and, 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 and I know people are kind of surprised, but when, when, when you call, you call and you talk to me. You don't talk to somebody else or my wife. or It's only my wife and I and my Border Collie puppy. So we're here to help. Uh, let me know what we can do. See you later. Awesome. Bye. Folks, thanks for hanging out. I'm putting a link in the section below, uh, and it's got a link to Steve's YouTube page. Go check that out. And if you like something, share it. Help us get the word out. Help some folks uh, find that their, their mule is not worth uh, given up on. Their mule is yep. actually worth investing in. So share yep. the information out there. And uh, until next week, we'll see y'all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.